This is Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, brought to you by the Iowa Soybean Association. Your daily recap of the information that affects Iowa's farmers, producers, and consumers, right here in the heart of the heartland. With reports from our award-winning broadcast team of Dustin Hoffman, Riley Smith, and Mark Magnuson. Now, from the IARN studios in Des Moines, here's Mark Magnuson. Hello and welcome into Ag Matters PM on the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Mark Magnuson. Today is Wednesday, October 12th, 2022, and we're so glad you could join us for today's show. And in today's episode, I will visit with Maury Hill. He is a soybean and corn farmer located on his farm near Perry, and we're going to talk all about the great Iowa soybean. And we also have a look at the ag weather outlook, but first, let's run down the markets. It's time now for the Ag Matters PM Closing Market Summary, your source for market analysis and settlement prices from the day's trade in Chicago, courtesy of the folks at agmarket.net. At the end of another trading day, we are joined now by Jacob Burks of agmarket.net for some market analysis. Jacob, first things first, it's a WASD day today. What were your takeaways from today? Uh, first, the first thing you notice, you had to see the explosion off the bean market, and uh, you know most of the algos were focused on what are the yields uh, coming out of the USDA. WASD surprised the market a little bit with a 49.8 uh, bushel per acre yield in the soybeans. You know that was well below uh, last week or last month's uh, 50.5, so seven tenths of a bushel less uh, per acre. Uh, most of the estimates were, were expecting a, a, a raise in the in the yield numbers. So when that came out as a lower yield and almost a full bushel, uh, that that surprised the market. We went 35, 40 cents higher pretty quick in the, the soybeans. It's back backed off here, but we stayed about 20 cents higher all day long. Corn market uh, a little bit of uh, you know question mark of where that yield was going to come in. Uh, the estimates were around the 171.8. Uh, we came out with 171.9. So not a huge surprise to it. I think where the uh, surprise came from uh, was cutting the, the production as much as they did. Ended up being well or well above what we were expecting on an ending stocks number. So with this ending stocks number 1.172, uh, the expectations were around 1.124. Don't confuse that with a really bearish report, though, because our ending stock was higher. Uh, we're, we're still in a pivotal point where you know this yield is going to change quite a bit, and we're very tight. These are very tight stocks numbers, and uh, there's just a lot of uh, a lot of volatility in this market for and, and rightfully so. Jacob, were there any other takeaways from the grain markets today? Uh, in the grains, I mean, really, uh, from a global standpoint, they didn't change a whole lot of the uh, the, the world numbers. Uh, so I, I don't think that there was a lot of uh, you know market movement due to the report there. But on the grain side of things, you're still looking at uh, export or the yield numbers coming in. Uh, you're still looking at uh, the river situation and basis levels across most of the uh, of the you know, growing area. Uh, there is a nice little rain event coming across here, slowing harvest down just a tick, uh, trying to get let these uh, let the railroads, let the river systems try to catch up and, and move some grain. Uh, but you know, back above seven dollars out there in the spring, going to be unchanged on the day. Uh, the bean market is back around the fourteen dollars, so we're at a kind of a status quo stuff at point right here in the grains right now. And what was the story today on the livestock markets? Uh, livestock's the you know relatively quiet, uh, which you know a lot of the focus in the trading was on the grains. Uh, but you know your your cash market hasn't really established in the live cattle. Uh, feeder cattle are, are were you know, pretty happy yesterday with the lower corn trade, uh, and we we saw a little bit of that again here today. We ended up going up 40, 50 cents in the feeder cattle, uh, and that's got a technical play there where uh, you know we've we've seen support. There's been some technical buying off of that. Uh, you know, yesterday's day was the uh, last time that, you know, that we'll uh, record uh, the uh, the funds, the funds position and that number will come out on Friday. So at that point, we'll see what these funds are doing. They have they're right now really close to a record short position in feeder cattle. Uh, so on Friday, we'll see what that's done here. And, uh, you know, uh, yesterday with the movement up, we probably bought some of those back. Uh, the hog market was probably the best story in the livestock complex, you know, a dollar fifteen higher right now. Uh, in the uh, the December contract, but all in all, pretty quiet day. Jacob, looking at the markets on the whole, what right now is the value of the U.S. dollar? Where are we at with that? We've seen some fluctuation and causing some different movement because of that. 
well, you know, we, we don't call we don't call it a black swan because we see it in front of us, right? So, you know, the the black clouds uh, that are looming over these grain markets and these agriculture markets uh, are are the global economic system. Whether you're talking uh, war in Ukraine, whether you're talking recession in Europe, uh, whether we're talking some of these other you know countries that rely on U the strength of the U.S. economy, uh, there's there's a lot of problems you know out there you know in in, the, in our midst. And you know the the value of the dollar today down 14 points, uh, but it's still trading around record highs. It's still trading almost at 113. We've been on both sides of 113 today. Uh, those those type of situations and that strength is really you know hurting the ability for people to come to us uh, to buy these agricultural commodities. So we're not the cheapest grain out there. We're not the cheapest corn, beans, or wheat out there. And that's you know that's really you know uh, digging into to our export system. So that's something that if you're watching if you're watching the value of the dollar. Uh, not so much that as as much as the you know what's going on in these other economies and and how their if their stability starts to wane, wane a little bit and that's really going to put a punch on us. Crude oil today, and if you if you look at crude oil, uh, we went up to like ninety one or ninety two at the end of last week, and we have sold off every day this week. We're down another two dollars here today. Our stock market is is a measurement of our economy and what's going on. We're a hundred points higher today, but we're well you know getting comfortable below thirty thousand. So. There's a lot of macroeconomics that play into our pocketbook here on the farm, and you know you, you do have to pay attention to that. And that's why we encourage a lot of guys to use some of these uh, these you know opportunities these, of protection because you don't know what's to come here in the next six months. You're opt we're optimistic that if our balance sheets are tight, that we have an opportunity to see higher prices. Uh, but knowing at any point, uh, you know we don't know who our who our customer is going to be. He's Jacob Burks from agmarket.net. Jacob, you just talked about those farmers trying to find all the information that they can. What can they do if they want to get in touch with agmarket.net? Hey, look us up on our on our website, agmarket.net, and take a 30-day free trial of our uh, information, uh, the agmarket.net intel, and you know that, that'll kind of get you uh, pointed in the right direction of who we are and what we're thinking and how we can communicate with you and the tools that we have that, that can help you out. Jacob, thank you for the time as always, and we'll talk to you again soon. Uh, thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thanks for having me. That was Jacob Burks from agmarket.net, and it's time now to take a look at the closing numbers courtesy of the folks at Bar Chart. December corn is unchanged at 693 even. November soybeans up 19 and three quarters at 1396 even. December soybean meal is up $8.30 at 41430. December soybean oil is up 12 cents at 65.59. Chicago wheat is down 18 and three quarters at 882 and a quarter. Minneapolis wheat is down 18 and a half at 966 and three quarters. And Kansas wheat is down 20 and three quarters at 970 even. December oats up 10 and a quarter at 402 and a half. On the Merck, live cattle for October up 37 cents at 146.17. October feeder cattle up 42 cents at 175.50. October lean hogs up 7 cents at 93.10. Pork cutouts for December up 80 cents at 90.87. And Class 3 milk for October up 5 cents at 21.84. And that's been a check of the Ag Market Recap here on Ag Matters PM. I'm going to go ahead and take a quick break now to hear from our sponsor, the Iowa Soybean Association and the Soy Checkoff. And when we come back, we will have our premier segment of Between the Pods, a special edition to AMPM. I'm going to speak with Maury Hill on his farm near Perry, Iowa. That's coming up next. This is Ag Matters PM. Iowa Soybean Association is driven to deliver for Iowa's 40,000 soybean farmers. We're proud to provide objective agronomic research, a helping hand with soil and water stewardship, and timely industry news powered by the Soybean Checkoff. Learn more at IASoybeans.com. Welcome back to Ag Matters PM from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. I'm Mark Magnuson. Well, today we bring you a special segment on the show. It is the premier segment of Between the Pots. It's where we will focus on soybeans here in the state of Iowa. And today we begin by visiting with Maury Hill. He is a farmer from Perry, Iowa. And we talk all about the benefits of growing soybeans, some of the difficulties and everything that it takes to be a great soybean farmer. It's time to go between the pods with the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network and the Iowa Soybean Association. For the next year, we will explore the ways Iowa grown soybeans are making a difference at home and around the world. Now, here's your host of Between the Pods, Mark Magnuson. Mark Magnuson here for the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network, and we are here on Between the Pods, and I'm joined by Maury Hill. Maury, it is a beautiful 
beautiful day out here and we're in fact just a few paces away from where your friend Mike was helping you to do some combining here of your soybean field. First of all, could you tell us where we are at and a little bit of the history of this site as a farm? Well, thanks for being here, Mark. We are just on the west side of Perry uh, on what was originally my grandparents' farm and we just started opening up the field today to combine these beans. Now, Maury, I asked you a very important question a little bit ago, and that is, how do you know when it is time to get in the field and start harvesting these beans? Well, you always look at the calendar and figure back when you planted, but the, the best way I was taught from my dad and my grandpa was just to come out and, and taste test and feel the beans, and you can tell whether they're ready to go or not. It's just, it's just one of those things you know. And I was gonna say, that that's more of an intuition thing. I don't think you're gonna probably get taught that at agronomy classes at Iowa State. I don't think so. I, I, I don't think there's any uh, IT program that will tell you that either. So we actually are out here in the field as you can see and Maury and Mike they've been doing some combining getting these beans out. Maury you mentioned to me that you did get these beans planted a little bit later than if in an ideal scenario you would have been in the field a little bit earlier this year but it didn't work out that way. Correct. Our, our April was so cold and wet that hardly a wheel turned in this area and so uh, uh, my corn didn't get planted, finished till about mid-May, and then we turned right around to beans. So these beans got planted right before Memorial Day, about the 22nd or 23rd of May, which is, you know, ideally, I would have liked them in the field, in the ground, a month sooner. Have you ever had to plant that late before, or was that a new experience for you? Oh, no. You, you've had this long enough. You get all sorts of places over the calendar. So it, it wasn't new. It's just nothing that we like to do. And that is another important point. As a farmer, how important is it to be adaptable because that calendar is always shifting? Oh, it's it just goes with the job. You, you got to be flexible and just roll with whatever, you know, nature throws at you and be able to deal with it. And you, you know, you make the best of whatever you've got. And Maury, how long have you been farming? Uh, I started part-time farming with my father in 80, right after I got married. And I had off-farm income for the first 20 years but I've been farming full time since 2000. And Maury, have you seen these yield numbers continue to climb each and every year? Is it almost like clockwork that the next year, it just seems like because of the hybrids and all the adaptable traits and everything, then the technology has just caused those numbers to climb? It, it has, Mark, and, it, and I, I attribute that to our genetics and to you know just the research that goes into the stuff we plant nowadays. And, but the one thing is, if you don't get that bump every year, you think something's wrong. And so you, uh, I take it with a grain of salt. You, you expect a little bump year after year, but you know, you got to have both sides of the line to get average. Maury, do you ever stop and think about that when you first started planting soybeans, just how different things are compared to now? Oh my gosh. Uh, yes, you know, when I started with my father, we were on, you know, 40 to 38 inch rows and, you know, uh, populations we weren't pushing them either on soybeans or corn and now here we are in this field they were drilled beans into standing corn stalks so they're no-till and uh, I'm not sure what my grandfather and my father would say about this but that's just what we do nowadays and are you a big advocate of the no-till uh, I, I am you know with uh, all the emphasis on on climate and 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 carbon reduction if there's something we can do to help keep that carbon in the soil it helps farmers it helps me and helps my bottom line and it also helps the environment. So I, I think no-till is, uh, is the way to go. And you also think about it, Maury, someone that could be in your spot, who knows, 50 years down the line, hopefully still being able to farm this ground, it goes into the sustainability aspect of it too. That's another big word in this, this day we live in is, is sustainability. And so, you know, I think I'm sustainable because I'm here standing talking to you. But you know, like you say, whoever comes after me, I want them to be able to stand here and talk to somebody else if they're sustainable also. And Maury, not just soybeans, you also plant corn. What else goes into your operation? How many acres do you farm? I farm about, row crop, about 300. 150 of corn, 150 of soybeans on a rotational basis. So I'm considered a small farmer by t today's standards, but by working with my neighbor who also has about the same amount of acres, we can make it work and still be profitable and, and hopefully sustainable. And Maury, you mentioned just got the combine rolling for beans. About how long will it take you to get done with beans and then start thinking about corn? Well, uh, once we get done here, we'll, we'll move up to northern part or southern part of Boone County and uh, start up there where Mike lives and where I grew up at. And we figure on a good day, if things go right, we can do 25 to 30 acres a day. So you can do the math and then as soon as that's done, we'll go right to corn. 
for you. There's a lot of different uses for soybeans. You are an Iowa Soybean Association member, so you're well aware of all of the benefits of soybeans, but do you think about that when you're out here farming, all the different things that these beans can do? Well, it's, you know, when I'm out here doing this sort of stuff, I'm, I'm focused on, you know, getting the, the beans into town or into the bin. But also, if I'm in the combine, you think about every sixth row of soybeans goes somewhere else. We sell it across the pond or to China, and to me, that's amazing that we have that much trade with our soybeans. And so, when you think about that, that's really important for our, my bottom line and all soybean farmers in Iowa that they can contribute to that and hopefully uh, have a better lifestyle. And Maury, does that give you a sense of pride too when, let's say, people from another country, we just had a delegation from Taiwan that was in Des Moines and they were purchasing some crops down the line here just from the state of Iowa because they know that quality. That, that, that's an awesome thing. I never would have dreamed I'd be doing that as, as a board director for the Soybean Association. We actually, uh, my wife and I got to have dinner with them last week in, in Des Moines and visit with them and uh, what trade missions I've been on and with the Soybean Association. It's really uh, positive that we can see those people that want our product, they understand the quality that we, we raise and that they want it and that they can put a face to the people that sell them to them. Now, did I hear right? A little birdie told me you just actually were on a trip, weren't you? Uh, I was in Cambodia in June. And what was that trip for? What did you learn about in Cambodia? That trip was for aquaculture, feeding fish. And what, what, what we're trying to do is teach the Cambodians how to use soy meal in their fish rations instead of fish meal, because it's being depleted, and that they, they can turn to a sustainable food source with U.S. or Iowa-grown soy meal in their fish rations and, and, and better their aquaculture and the people that want to eat fish. And does that soy meal get the job done just like fish meal would? Oh, it does. It, and, and from what I understand, it's even better because of the amino acid profile that soybeans have, that it, it's tremendous uh, growth and uh, return of investment for the fish farmer. So, Maury, how did you get involved with the Iowa Soybean Association and become a board member to get to do cool things like that? Somebody asked me. So you must have, you had a reputation that preceded you. I guess that's a good thing in this case. Well, yeah, I'm sure, that, I'm not sure what the reputation was, but at least I, I had a, a few people that were, were aware of me and evidently thought I was doing a good job with whatever else I was doing. And uh, I got elected to the Iowa board in 2014. And then I was fortunate enough to get elected to the American Soybean Association in 16. So it's, uh, it's been quite an experience. What's your favorite thing about growing soybeans as a farmer? I think it, any farm will tell you this. It's when you when you take a seed like that and put it in the ground in the spring, and then come the fall, you see something like this. You just think that's really cool, and I helped do that, even though I didn't make it grow, but I got it there so it could grow. And what's the hardest thing about growing soybeans? We know you know these crops. It's not easy to grow them necessarily, but we've made it easier for us. But what's the hardest thing? Um, I think uh, in this world we live in now and especially with uh, our, our crop protection products it's uh, maybe our, our weed resistance and, and trying to figure out the best possible seed and the best possible place to do it. And do you think right now as a whole growing soybeans is in a great spot for farmers here in, in Iowa? Do you think farmers are in a very good place going forward to continue to put out these great numbers we've seen from the yield numbers in soybeans? Oh definitely and you know because you know us that live in Iowa, we won the land lottery. We got such great soils that until, you know, the next ice age comes, soybeans will be a big deal. All right, he is Maury Hill. Maury, is there anything else you'd like to let our listeners, our viewers know about when it comes to farming soybeans and just all the work that goes into uh, making these beans available for the world, really? Well, I would just say, you know, that uh, being on the Soybean Association, our, our tagline is driven to deliver. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to d deliver results and research for our Iowa soybean growers and make the world better for everybody else. Well, Maury, thanks so much for taking time. I know you're very busy right now. We really appreciate it and have a great rest of your harvest. Thank you. That once again was Maury Hill, a soybean farmer from central Iowa on our premier segment of Between the Pods. As for right now, let's take a look at the ag weather outlook. Pretty calm and fair day here in the state of Iowa today. A little bit windier in the west, a little bit of chances for showers in the east here in central Iowa. The sun is out and shining and we are comfortable. 
Tonight, it will be a clear and calm evening, cooler temperatures, but it should be a very nice night overall. And looking ahead to tomorrow, it will cool off a little bit, going to have high temperatures in the 50s. So let's take a look now at what the National Weather Service has in store for the next 24 hours. As you can see from the National Weather Service, another nice, fair fall day in the state of Iowa, mostly sunny and breezy in the western part of the state, cloudy with chances of rain in the east, cooler temperatures in the east as well. We've had lows today in the low 60s and highs in the upper 60s. Tonight, a pretty clear and calm evening, clearing skies and cool temperatures Lows expected to be in the upper 30s with highs in the low 40s. And tomorrow, another nice fall day, a little bit cooler, mostly sunny and breezy, and those temperatures expected to range from the low 50s to the upper 50s. And turning our attention now to the affiliate weather map for tomorrow, Cherokee, sunny and 52 degrees, a little bit on the cooler side. Shenandoah, 59 degrees and sunny. In Des Moines, 56 and sunny. Albia, 57 and sunny, clear skies. Waterloo, the same, clear skies and sunny with 52. And Clinton at 54 with more sunshine. For a more detailed forecast in your part of the state, check with your local Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network affiliate. And that's been a check of the Ag Weather Outlook. And that also brings us to the end of this episode of Ag Matters PM. As always, you can find all of our content on our website at iowaagnet.com. You can also follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And you can find all of our video content on our YouTube channel and while you're there, make sure you subscribe. Also click on the notification icon, the bell icon, that will let you know whenever there's new video content from the Iowa Agribusiness Radio Network. And don't forget our free twice daily market podcast found wherever you find your favorite podcast, Apple, Amazon, Google, Spotify, and Podbean. From the IARN studios in Des Moines, I'm Mark Magnuson. On behalf of Riley Smith and Dustin Huffman, thank you for watching. This has been Ag Matters PM.